Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Jordi Bover. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, my name Jordi uh, stands for George in, in Catalan. And, and I'm a nephrologist in, in Badalona, uh, Barcelona, the North Metropolitan Area. And I'm one of the co-founders of the CKD MBD Working Group for the European Renal Association. And I, first of all, I want to thank the ERA for this invitation to share this uh, seminar with um, uh, excellent, uh, superb speakers and, and panelists, and uh, as well as they are also also friends. I welcome you all to uh, to this e seminar organized by uh, by our group, and the title is Chronic Kidney Disease and Mon uh, Mineral Bone Disorders from Bone Biopsy to Treatment in Advanced CKD Patients not vice versa. Uh, I'm, uh, we're actually all looking forward uh, to hearing whether this approach, the not vice versa thing, is possible by allowing us to jump over the hurdles of bone biopsies in a moment where nephrologists have to consider DEXAs and the treatment of these so-called osteoporosis associated with chronic kidney disease according to the new KDGO guidelines, well, the not so new KDGO guidelines and uh, the take action warning that we all uh, nephrologists have. Uh, before uh, starting, let, let me give you also some housekeeping information. And uh, you shall be aware that there is a Q, uh, question and answer uh, feature to ask questions during the meeting, either privately or for everyone uh, in a written form, or some of them will be answered live if we have enough time. And you should also know that there is a real-time translation. DIRA is launching a real-time translation, audio and captions with artificial intelligence in seven languages, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Turkish. To enable the audio, the audio uh, click on the globe icon at the bottom near the pulse function and choose your language. And for the captions, an external link to access through the browser will be provided within the chat. And uh, finally, regarding credits, by participating live, participants will earn one European credit for their CME. And this is an exclusive benefit for active ERA members only. To get the diploma, attendees must fill in the mandatory questionnaire feedback at the end of the seminar. Well, uh, having said so, I'm very honored to introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Peter Ebenepoel. Uh, he, is, um, uh, he belongs to the Nephrology and Renal Transplantation Research Group in, in Leuven, uh, Belgium. He's also a senior academic staff in the Council of the Faculty and uh, Medicine Department of uh, Microbiology, Immunology and Transplantation in, in Leuven and he will talk to us about the current role of bone biopsy in clinical practice. And as a panelist, we will invite to comment to Dr. Han Jorgensen, which is an associate professor of the Aarhus University in Denmark and a, steering, and a member of the steering committee also of the European ROT Initiative, Renal Osteodystrophy Initiative, who was founded also by Dr. Peter Benepol. Peter, the floor, I should say the screen is yours. So I uh, was asked to discuss with you in these 15 minutes the role of bone biopsy in clinical practice. So this is my disclosure of interest. And this is in fact a bit the outline what I would like to discuss in the next 15 minutes. So most importantly, when to consider the bone biopsy. Uh, how do we assess the bone biopsy? So the difference between the qualitative and the quantitative bone histomorphometry. And in fact, probably the most important question for you all is how we can implement bone biopsies in clinical practice in your unit uh, at home. So starting just to emphasize the burden of lectures, I think this is a very nice uh, picture taken from a not that recent publication by uh, uh, Tom Nicholas uh, some years ago, and it depicts the uh, fracture incidence, the hip fracture incidence in patients across age categories. And what's important, we all know, the uh, incidence will increase as the age increase, 
But this figure also shows that there is a stepwise increase in the incidence of hip fractures according to the severity of the chronic kidney disease. And it's the highest in the patients on hemodialysis. Uh, the risk as, is estimated to be as fourfold as high as in uh, gender and age matched controls. So these patients do face a tremendous uh, fracture, uh, risk fracture um, uh, uh, along their lives. And that's something that we should should not neglect. So, um, in in a way, this this how we address this as clinicians is that we thought, okay, fractures, it's important. It's uh, the patient will will certainly suffer from this fracture, but in many cases, we thought, okay, this is a complex disease. There is some uh, renal bone disease, uh, renal osteodystrophy, and in order to further define this disease. We need a bone biopsy, but unfortunately, we don't have access to bone biopsy. So in many cases, um, we close the books, we uh, sit down and relax, and we just did do nothing about the fracture in this patient. So doing nothing is an option, but not always the best option. In a way, um, it should be clear to us, all of us, and that's something that we learned from the many bone biopsies that we have performed in Leuven. So in a way, we had a protocol, we had a a research protocol in, in which we perform bone biopsies in all patients that were referred for the kidney transplantation without knowledge of the PTH, phosphate level, whatever. So this was like a protocol a bone biopsy cohort that we built over several years. And to some kind of a surprise when we analyzed the data, and this is just from a publication from two years ago by Hanna was first author, in which we uh, uh, assessed the natural history of bone histomorphotry in patients with end-stage kidney disease, so during the first year of transplantation. What's, what's surprising to some extent was that, indeed, if we analyze the bone biopsies according to the turnover, mineralization, and volume categories, which is nowadays the gold standard to analyze bone biopsies, we came to the discovery to say so that most of the patients do have, in fact, a normal bone turnover and only 20% to have a, either a high or low bone turnover uh, while uh, being dialyzed, while mineralization defects were completely absent. Only 1% of the patients did show a mineralization defect. So the, the idea that we all had that this kind of uh, renal bone disease is very common in our patients. It seems not to be the case. So most patients with end-stage kidney disease, and I, there's a disclaimer, these are all the best kids of the class, meaning these are transplant candidates. At least in these patients, the bone histomorphotry at large is almost normal. So bone quality is impaired, but not in all patients. What was striking also when we analyzed the uh, bone mass using the DEXA scans, which is the most common way to, to assess the bone mineral density and the bone mass in these patients, you can see in this graph on the right hand side that if you look at, for example, the most important skeletal site, which is the lumbar spine and the femoral neck, about 20 to 25% of these patients presented with osteoporosis and uh, something like 30 to 40% with osteopenia. So meaning that osteoporosis or low bone mineral density is very common in these patients. So most probably the increased fracture risk that we see in our patients is largely driven by the loss of bone mass. So a decrease in bone quantity and less than we thought before due to a loss of bone quality. And together with the increased fall risk in these patients, this uh, will contribute to the fourfold increased hip fracture risk in patients with end-stage kidney disease. So in a way, this, this, um, this triggered some kind of change in the terminology. So before we spoke about renal osteodystrophy and uh, what was in the last, um, I mean, meeting in Madrid organized by Kedigo, there seems to be a shift from using this term to another term called CKD associated osteoporosis. Because in a way, renal osteodystrophy is leading to a nihilism, while 
the term osteoporosis is a call for action. Like we do in general population, osteoporosis, everyone's knows you need to take action. So in a way, we are moving from nihilism to pragmatism. And I do believe this is a, a good way to, to walk um, and, and, and to go in this direction, because at the end, this will prevent many fractures in patients with uh, CKD. So moving to the, the second question, when to consider bone biopsy in the diagnostic workup of CKD-associated osteoporosis? Um, and uh, let's start with a clinical vignette. This is a patient 78 uh, years old. He's been referred by your colleague, the hepatologist. He's a liver transplant because of a hepatocellular carcinoma. He also, he also has some diabetes, diabetes type two. And he presents with a CKD grade four with a PTH, which is rather low for this uh, degree of kidney dysfunction, and also a calcium level and a phosphate level in the low to normal range. And his 25 hydroxyvitamin D is uh, in the lower end with 17 micrograms per liter. And for some reason, the GP performed uh, a DEXA scan, and these are the results. So this is frank uh, osteoporosis. And on top of that, and that was the reason why the patient was referred, he also had a history of uh, multiple fractures uh, in rib, ankle, and shoulder. So the big question is how to deal with this. This is a patient who is sitting in front of you in our patient clinic, and you need to come up with some, some answers, how, how, how to approach such a, such a patient. And, and luckily, uh, this is a, a paper which is in press, and I, I would certainly uh, advocate to, to, to download it and read it, because it certainly will guide you through the diagnostics to the difficult diagnostics of bone fragility. It's, it's uh, um, uh, summarized in 10 steps, starting with, of course, awareness of the fracture risk, evaluating the clinical risk factors, review osteotoxic drugs, for example, the vitamin K uh, antagonist, or the proton pump inhibitors or steroids, for, for example, as was in our patient, but also looking at the musculoskeletal function of this patient, looking at his intake of calcium and uh, vitamin D exposure, uh, monitor the bone biomarkers, and that's something which certainly will, inc uh, will gain emphasis uh, in the future. What we do nowadays uh, in most patients is to assess the bone mineral density by DEXA, assess bone quality by novel techniques, which are available in some uh, units. But then, and important for this talk, is consider the bone biopsy in some cases and ask a multidisciplinary team. So this is the way how to go from a complex problem and try to diagnose it and, and see whether or not it needs further treatment. So when to consider bone biopsy, and this is just a picture taken from this uh, CK journal uh, review paper that will be published soon, is bone biopsy is not needed in all patients. So it's an important take-home message. Not all patients presenting with bone fragility need a bone biopsy. So it's not mandatory step in the evaluation of CKD-associated osteoporosis. It's only something you should consider in complex cases. And what are complex cases? Uh, these are cases in whom you suspect a mineralization defect. So a patient with bone pain, long-standing hypophosphatemia, hypocalcemia, low vitamin D levels. This is the case that you could mm, probably consider as one with a mineralization defect. Or you want to exclude a low bone turnover because you consider to give an anti-resorptive agent and you don't want to suppress the bone turnover further down. Or you find discrepant uh, biomarker findings, for example, a low PTH but an elevated alkaline phosphatase, which is also some kind of um, pointing to uh, osteomalacia. Or a patient with multiple or atypical fractures or important comorbidities like this patient with hemochromatosis and a liver transplant. So these are all indications that could push you to uh, take the decision that you need a bone biopsy in, in, in order to enable you to offer the best uh, treatment. So to summarize, it's reasonable to perform a, a bone biopsy to exclude a bone mineralization defect first, to confirm suspicions of low bone turnover, and finally to rule out a typical bone pathology. And of course, you only do a bone biopsy when it will impact your therapeutic approach. In a way, bone turnover is becoming 
very important both in the diagnosis and therapy of patients presenting with bone fragility. So this graph figure shows you that when you see a patient with a bone fragility, you should look at osteoporosis, you should look at CKD and BD. First, try to optimize the CKD and BD and then address the osteoporosis uh, problem. And in both of them, knowledge of bone turnover is really important. And to get knowledge of bone turnover, you can do it with bone histomorphically, but also with bone biomarkers. And in a way, bone biomarkers is something which can be of help. And this is um, also thanks to the, the, the fact that we built this, this uh, important um, bone biopsy database with also available bone biomarkers. We were able to assess the diagnostic accuracy of uh, novel biomarkers like the intact P1 and P, trap 5B, and bone specific alkaline phosphatase, all by all bone biomarkers uh, that are not cleared by the kidneys. So, very uh, interesting in the setting of chronic kidney disease. An important take home message from these studies is that, in fact, these bone biomarkers they do a good job. Uh, they, they show a very high negative predictive value. So these are very interesting to exclude um, either a high or a low bone turnover. So they certainly can be of help in excluding um, low bone turnover disease and uh, high bone turnover disease. And it's also reassuring that these kind of cutoffs that we defined in this study show similarity with cutoffs being defined in another study. So there is certainly some consistency uh, across studies, which which uh, says that in fact these these cutoffs could be considered robust um, uh, uh, cutoffs that can be used in, in clinical practice. So in our case, you can see what we what we did find. In a way, uh, by, by analyzing these these levels and and looking at the cutoffs, uh, it was um, uh, very obvious that this is a case which uh, has certainly no high bone turnover. So we can exclude high bone turnover, but we cannot confirm low bone turnover uh, or confirm a normal bone turnover. So it can be of help, but it's not, let's say, it will never give you the final diagnosis for sure. So once we, and I think in this case, I, I do believe, so this case of a liver transplantation, I do believe that that all everything points that we need uh, a bone biopsy. Then the question is whether we should go for the qualitative or the quantitative assessment. I can go very quickly over this. Um, so once we have done the bone biopsy, and Maurizio certainly will tell you what are the, how to perform a bone biopsy, which needles, and how we can do it in the least uh, invasive way. Once we have it, we can store it in ethanol, 70%. It can be on the bench for several days, so it, you have time to send it to uh, an, an analyzing lab. It will be dehydrated, impregnated, uh, embedded in methyl methylacrylate, and then it will be stained, it will be cut, and it will be analyzed. And in the analysis, there is two ways to analyze. You can just have the overall general, let's say, impression by the pathologist or by the bone own expert looking at the scrolling through the bone biopsy and giving uh, his or her impression, impression on bone turnover, mineralization, and volume. This is the qualitative assessment. Or you could do it in another way where you start measuring everything. And then this is what we call the um, uh, quantitative um, bone histomorphometry. So um, this is normal histology. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the, the trabecula with the mineralized bone in blue and the non-mineralized bone in, in red. And this is a normal distribution. Um, in analyzing as said, we are moving from the old nomenclature to the new TMV nomenclature, turnover, mineralization, and uh, volume. These are some examples of uh, abnormal bone histomorphometry, so high bone turnover will be uh, seen by, um, this is the, again the trabecula, these are the um, the uh, the bone which is completely mineralized. Uh, and then you have on the other borders, you have uh, active zones where you can see this multi-nuclear uh, cells called the bone resorbing osteoclasts. So there will be a lot of osteoclastic activity 
which uh, depicts the typical picture of a, a high bone turnover uh, state. Low bone turnover, the opposite, there is almost no activity of bone cells at the borders of the uh, trabeculae. And if there is a lot of uh, bone, but even more unmineralized bone, so this is the, the reddish bone, then we uh, that, that's a clear example of an abnormal mineralization, uh, what we also call osteomalacia. Quantitative bone histomorphometry, um, qualitative bone histomorphometry also includes the, the labels. So we, we give our patients tetracyclines, which are built in at the mineralization front, and we give them twice. And to, by measuring the distance between the two lines of deposition of this label, we can calculate the mineral apposition weight of also the bone formation rate, which is very important in categorizing the turnover status of the patient. So as I said, we can also do the quantitative uh, bone histomorphy. There's a lot of parameters that needs to be assessed. It's a time-consuming process. So, uh, I mean, it takes about four hours to read one bone biopsies. So it's also then become very costly and it's all, not always needed in the clinical practice uh, that I would like to see. Finally, how to implement bone biopsies in clinical practice. Um, so it's not that you, all of you have in your unit have a bone uh, expert uh, able to read a bone biopsy. So I think we have to move to what I, I could call a hub uh, of experts uh, or the multidisciplinary team, which is indeed uh, a team of experts in bone pathology and bone disease. So when one, if you as a, as a nephrologist uh, see a patient with a complex uh, bone uh, condition, should not be all bone conditions, but the complex bone conditions, you don't know what to do. And you believe based on the criteria just given that the bone biopsy could be helpful in, in uh, reaching the, the right diagnosis, you could refer the, the file to this uh, multidisciplinary team. They will have a look at the data. They will uh, conclude, yes, indeed, a bone biopsy is needed. They will, they will be able to do the bone biopsy, read the bone biopsy. They will produce a report and give feedback to the treating physician. Who should be in this multidisciplinary team? Every physician expert in bone, and you know in every uh, unit it can be different. It can be the nephrologist, it can be a rheumatologist, an endocrinologist, whatever. Everyone with expertise uh, could uh, join this, this uh, multidisciplinary team, which can be organized at the local level or could also be organized at the regional level or the national level. So that's something that needs to be figured out. So I think there is several problems and several issues in doing uh, bone biopsies. And, and many of you would say this is a very in invasive and laborious procedure. But I think nowadays, and, and Maurizio will, will confirm this in his talk with using the, 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 the uh, smaller needles, this is becoming really something which is doable. The discomfort for the patient is minimal when you have uh, some sedation and adequate anesthesia. And again, if you use uh, the small Yamashidi light needles, but also other centers use still the big Bourdieu needles. They tell us when you use these needles in an adequately anesthetized and sedated patient, it's really something which is causing little discomfort for the patient. More problematic is the lacking histomorphometric expertise. And again, you should start discussion with your pathologists. Most of them do have experience also with reading bone tissue, for example, bone uh, tumors. And it's only a little step uh, to move to bone histomorphometry. Also try to uh, consider the um, the help from, from technicians with expertise in experimental histomorphometry. This is, for example, uh, in, in my unit is the case. So the, the, the real uh, reading of the, the quantitative bone histomorphometry is done by a technician. Um, and of course, uh, look around in your region, in your country, is there a multidisciplinary team to whom you can refer your patients for a, a bone biopsy or at least for analyzing the bone biopsy? A bone biopsy is costly, but of course, you always need to balance the cost against the cost of an inappropriate medical therapy and also the cost uh, of a prevented fracture. So this brings me to my take-home messages. So I, I do believe the bone biopsy must be viewed 
as an asset, not an obstacle in providing optimal care for patients with complex CKD associated osteoporosis. So not all patients, but only those with a complex presentation. Expert qualitative bone histomorphometry may be sufficient to guide clinical decisions. So you don't need the quantitative bone histomorphometry in all your cases. A qualitative assessment can be rather quick. Uh, it's in many cases sufficient to guide the therapy. And finally, we should try to build these multidisciplinary teams. We will have access to bone histomorphometry and also other expert diagnostics because these teams may guarantee optimal care for patients with complex CKD-associated osteoporosis. And this needs to be organized at the local, regional, national, and international level. So thank you. I would like to, to finish by uh, inviting you to certainly also join the forthcoming ERA meeting. There will also be a learn by practice session where we will discuss cases and your active contribution and input is certainly uh, something that 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 uh, could lift this session to a very high level. And also I already now announce the eight Euro winter meeting that will uh, deal with the central theme of diabetes and obesity organized in January 15, 17, 2025. So uh, mark your calendar already now. And if you have questions um, on this topic, uh, stay connected uh, via Twitter or uh, using the website. Many thanks and I'm looking forward to questions. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Now it's time for Anne, if she wants to comment on your presentation. Thank you. That was quite the tour de force of a lot of information jammed into 15 minutes. It's a short time to get through such a big topic. I was looking at the list of questions that we already got from participants before the meeting started, and several of them were regarding indications for bone biopsy. So what would you consider an absolute indication for a bone biopsy in different situations? So for example, in free dialysis CKD in a dialysis patient and CKD and even a kidney transplant recipients. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, well, the, the indication is for the, it's very difficult. It's no way, it's never been an absolute indication. You can do medicine, you can do nephrology, you can do, um, you can address CKD, MBD problems without having access to bone biopsy. Again, I said in my conclusion, it's an assay. It's not something also uh, a conditio sine qua non. You don't need it always, but it can be very helpful. And for me, the most important, and also that's what is is uh, told to me to my colleagues uh, of, of of the bone clinic, is the ones with suspicion of osteomalacia, so bone pain, a low phosphate, uh, long-standing metabolic acidosis in a patient with whatever degree of CKD. Uh, presenting with um, being referred by the GP with a, a DEXA scan showing some some um, um, a, a T-score below uh, three, for example. This is a case where before just starting the most common therapy, an anti-resorptive agent would be uh, to perform a bone biopsy to exclude uh, osteomalacia because this, um, in this case, uh, the, the 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 treatment would be to correct the acidosis to uh, sup, uh, supplement calcium and phosphate or vitamin D. So that will would would have an an, an immense um, therapeutic uh, impact. So if there is a potential therapeutic impact. Uh, please go ahead with a bone biopsy. And another uh, example could be um, a patient with, um, for example, post-transplant with persistent hypercalcemia. Um, and um, you you um, considered performing a PTX, so surgery, because this is, this is really something that cannot be solved. Um, and you suspect a, a high bone turnover and the bone turnover markers in that patient, uh, or the bone turnover markers in that patient, are either let's say inconclusive, or you're, they're not available in your unit, whatever. Then a bone biopsy certainly could uh, confirm uh, a, a high bone turnover disease, and it would certainly then facilitate to convince the patient to go ahead with uh, a paratidectomy. So that that just two examples of of in whom I I would believe a bone biopsy is something which could be could be of help, and of course, any um, 
fracture history in whatever stage of CKD when 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 the biochemistry or the the, the clinical circumstances are so um, I mean not not contributing or, or I mean um, not not helping that much or at least creating a very complex uh, uh, issue then also bone biopsy uh, will will give you uh, the answer at the end uh, the tissue the, the issue is the tissue and and this is the same for kidney biopsies uh, and and also for bone biopsies it's at the end it's the gold standard will point will point to the pathology which which is playing yeah yeah i think one thing that you also um, put a lot of emphasis on in your presentation is the is the, the clinical picture and it's also what we discussed at the Cadigo controversies conference that we need to move a bit away from from having these list of indications and these biomarkers and biochemical presentations and more consider what what's happening with the patient is this a symptomatic patient has yeah. there been a fracture do you want to go towards treatment and and then what will you choose yeah. um, and certainly in my center we don't have access to bone biopsies and so we've never even really considered if we needed bone biopsies in clinical terms, but after setting up a multidisciplinary team where we discuss patients based on the clinical presentations, someone who's had a fracture, for example, or where we're thinking about a parathyroidectomy, then the need arises and we're sitting with a clinical problem. We have osteoporosis, we have a fracture, and how do we want to treat this patient? And then we really might want to have this detailed information of, of uh, bone turnover minimization. I know Jordi is probably looking at the time. There's one more question I would like to take from the Q&A regarding treatment options. So would you consider a bone biopsy important also when you choose treatment options? For example, an anti-resorptive agent versus an anabolic agent? Yeah, yeah, for me, so that's, I mean, so... Um... <sighs> At the end, it may not be an obstacle. Again, uh, I repeat, but but if you have a patient with with um, end stage kidney disease on dialysis, and and you find these bone turnovers, which are excluding, like in this case, excluding high bone turnover, but not excluding, but even as in this patient, for example, I I presented this is a patient with a CKD stage four with um, with um, uh, a PTH which is rather low, and also the um, uh, the calcium phosphor low. So at least in this patient, the, the PTH is low for the degree of of um, of kidney dysfunction, and and the bone the no, bone biomarks, as I shown you, also are in the lower range. So this is more like a patient pointing to most probably a, a low bone turnover. I would I I would be um, pleased to to confirm this with a bone biopsy, and. At least this is not the case in Belgium, but um, so uh, th there's on the one hand the desire to give this patient, of course, an, an uh, anabolic agent, uh, but not, it's not always reimbursed. So that, that's an issue, of course, besides uh, coming to the right diagnosis is also the, the whole issue of reimbursement. But but I mean, this is different in, in all countries. But uh, if you, in this case, would, would um, do a bone biopsy, you, you could avoid... Uh, that you start in this patient an anti agent, which um, if it doesn't cause harm, uh, I don't believe it will cause harm, but some other people will, will have a different opinion on that. But at least it will not be efficacious because um, an mm -hmm. anti agent in the patient with a low bone turnover will not be uh, efficacious. Uh, so in that patient, an anabolic agent would be, would be much more um, advised. But... I mean, in order to just pick out the patient with a low bone turnover is the only way to diagnose low bone turnover is a bone biopsy. But it's always balancing uh, a bone biopsy. Certainly, I, I think in the future there will be more if the, the access to the bone biopsy is is uh, lower. So the threshold for doing a bone biopsy will be lower. There will be more bone biopsies performed. The, then the turnaround time will be shorter. And that time, I think we will increase the, the, the exposure or, or uh, uh, increase the implementation of bone biopsy in clinical practice, which certainly will be uh, a help for, 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 for practice in a way. So I think we, we, we should, we should um, try to, to, to get this, this happen that we, that we lower the threshold for, for bone biopsies. 
Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Thank you very much, Han. I think that we are perfectly on time. Actually, we have already answered several of the questions. For instance, uh, Dr. Ramadan, who's been very, very active. And uh, we'll come back then uh, after the next presentation to the question and answer, uh, and answer uh, point. Uh, now it's time to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Maurizio Galieni. Dr. Maurizio Galieni is very well known by all of you. He's the director of the nephrology and the dialysis at uh, Fatevene Fratelli Sacco. I hope that I said that uh, properly uh, in um, uh, hospitals in Milano. He's also a professor of nephrology and director of the School of Nephrology in, uh, in Milano. And uh, he will have as a panelist uh, the very well known as well, Dr. Maria Fusaro, who is a researcher at the National Research Council in Pisa and the Department of Medicine University of Padua in, in Italy. And she's also a member of several national and international uh, working groups and chair of the CKE Working Group of the International Osteoporosis Foundation. So, uh, Dr. Galgeni, Dr. Fusaro, Dr. Galgeni, the floor is yours, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Jordi, for the nice presentation. And uh, thank you to the European Renal Association for the invitation to participate into this uh, seminar. And thanks to all the people that are watching us, because uh, I believe that uh, this topic has been neglected for a long time. And uh, I feel that there is now a new interest in it. And as Peter um, pointed out, uh, one of the hurdles in uh, having uh, more biopsies uh, performed is uh, the technical issue. Uh, I hope uh, to demonstrate that uh, uh, with new approaches, uh, uh, the part of performing the biopsy uh, can be done uh, in many centers. Uh, and if we will have uh, enough uh, centers, hub centers that will read the biopsies, uh, we could move forward and increase the number of bone biopsies performed in Europe. Uh, these are my disclosures. And uh, I just remember how is, it is important uh, to have uh, uh, the uh, technical issues that include the preparation of uh, the biopsy and in particular the uh, tetracycline double leveling. In this slide, uh, you can see how it is done. Uh, and it takes about a month of preparation before uh, moving forward to perform the biopsy. Uh, so the procedure can be summarized as uh, it is in, in this slide. So we start with the uh, tetracycline double labbing, and then it's quite important to perform the procedure in uh, sedation in our view, uh, because only local anesthesia is not enough to control pain. And uh, if pain is not controlled, the patient will not be willing to uh, repeat the bone biopsy in the future uh, when needed. Uh, while it can be important to have more than one biopsy in the uh, clinical history of the patient sometimes to understand if uh, a disease that was diagnosed is properly treated or if uh, changes in the treatment are needed. Uh, as you can see here in the sampling uh, box, uh, we have uh, different uh, uh, diameters of the needles and the trifine internal diameter. The uh, traditional Bordier needle uh, is quite large, 7.5 millimeters. But we also now have uh, uh, new needles that has been, uh, have been used uh, with less than five millimeters. This is quite uh, an old uh, uh, manuscript, but I think it's very interesting because uh, it clearly describes uh, the technical aspects of uh, performing a, a, an iliac crest biopsy. It comes from uh, uh, the group of uh, um, Los Angeles in California. 
And uh, in, in this uh, uh, picture, you can see the Bordier uh, trefine needle, uh, which has uh, this core diameter of uh, uh, about seven millimeters. And very quickly, uh, I report to the pictures from the paper. The biopsy site is identified two centimeters posterior uh, to the anterior iliac crest. And the dotted line is uh, the iliac crest. So it's about two centimeters uh, here. Uh, then you have uh, anesthesia and local, uh, local anesthesia plus sedation. Then after uh, the anesthesia, you uh, perform a small incision and you um, separate the muscle and the fascia by blunted dissection until you reach the periosteum. Uh, and then the pointed uh, obturator together with the outer guide is inserted and applied firmly to the exposed bone. And then uh, the trefine is inserted into the outer guide and rotated counterclockwise with steady pressure until the cutting action of the trefine on the bone is felt. This can be the most uh, painful part, especially if uh, anesthesia is not done properly. Uh, here you can see the trefine advancing through the full length of the iliac crest. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, basically uh, after that, uh, the procedure is completed. In this uh, uh, manuscript from 2016, so it's uh, about uh, uh, eight years, uh, Dr. Wallace and collaborators already described a different approach with a drill assisted biopsy uh, system. And uh, you see that uh, results were very good. Out of 700 uh, drill-assisted biopsies, uh, there were no complications reported. The success rate was very high at 99.9%. Uh, .9%. There were a few crash artifacts with the uh, biopsy sample, 5.8% of specimen. Uh, and 2.1% uh, were uh, finally considered inadequate for histologic evaluation. So basically a 98% um, uh, rate of success, uh, which I think is very, very good. Now I want to present uh, the um, drill assist uh, uh, bone biopsy system that uh, we are using. You see it's a... Uh, uh, battery powder uh, powered drill, which is uh, quite small and easy to handle. And this is uh, uh, the kit. And I will show you more details on this. Uh, these also are pictures uh, from the uh, paper of uh, Dr. Wallace, uh, who actually uh, described uh, their results uh, with this uh, device. Uh, this is uh, another uh, manuscript uh, from uh, 2013, again, uh, looking at the effect of uh, a power bone marrow biopsy system compared to the manual system. And here we have a forest plot that is centered on uh, the VAS, the visual analog scale, uh, considering the overall pain uh, of the patient. And you see that uh, there is, uh, uh, in the meta-analysis, uh, uh, there is a, a clear uh, advantage uh, favoring the powered system compared to the manual system. And uh, when we consider the quality of the uh, bone biopsy uh, samples, you see also that uh, the powered uh, system is favored over the manual needle. And uh, again, uh, we have here uh, hematology reports 
uh, that uh, is investigating a, a very interesting point, uh, which is uh, that the on-control uh, uh, bone marrow biopsy technique is superior to the standard manual technique for hematologists in training. Uh, and uh, so it is much more easy to perform the biopsy with a drilled uh, uh, powered system and also I made uh, this uh, red box on another important point that I was mentioning before, which is the willingness of patients to repeat the bone biopsy. And you see that uh, uh, it is favoring the um, um, drill uh, bone biopsy uh, technique. Now a very uh, quick uh, way, I will show you uh, first uh, uh, the device. Uh, so this is uh, in a simulation uh, uh, um, setting. You see this is uh, the drill, which is inserted into the um, uh, sterile system. And this is the needle uh, with the trefine inside. And uh, this is how the needle is mounted on the uh, drill. And uh, uh, now the, this is again in a simulation setting. Uh, first, a local anesthesia, and then we prepare uh, the drill. And this is uh, when uh, uh, we perform a, a biopsy, a simulated biopsy, with the, the system news uh, like the hematologists do. You see that is, it is vertical on the bone and we have a simulator uh, of, of the bone. Um, what I usually do is just to uh, put the needle uh, in contact with bone in a similar way to what is done with the Bordier needle. And after uh, we got into contact with the periosteums, we connect, uh, we remove uh, the trefine inside and we connect the uh, drill to the needle. Uh, and then you see after the uh, um, biopsy has been performed, the uh, drill is taken out. And, and then there is a, a system just to push the uh, biopsy sample outside of the uh, refine. And this is the final result in the simulator. And now, Again, very uh, quickly, I will show you a few pictures of the real procedures. Uh, um, here we have, uh, after the anesthesia, we are doing a very small incision. It's only one to two millimeters. Then we connect the, uh, the needle to the periosteum, as I, I was telling you before, and then we remove the internal part to um, connect the needle to the uh, drill. And then this is while I am doing the uh, collection of the sample. This is while I'm uh, removing. And after the removal, we disconnect the drill and we get our sample. Uh, this is an example of two pictures uh, of our uh, sample in a uh, transplanted patient who finally had uh, uh, a very uh, severe case of low bone turnover. Um, just to show you that our hub in this moment is uh, Professor Luca Dalle Calbonare in Verona. So we sent the sample to Verona for, uh, for the analysis. But I'm showing just to show you uh, the actually the quality of the uh, sample, uh, the cortical part and the trabecular part uh, is, is quite good. So the point uh, and a question that can be asked, uh, and uh, with this, I would leave the uh, floor to Maria, uh, is, is the smaller uh, bone biopsy sample, because it's uh, in this case is 3.5 millimeter compared to seven to 7.5 millimeters, uh, obtain with the power drill a problematic issue. And uh, to address this question, uh, we are starting uh, in the coming weeks, uh, hopefully, uh, because we are ready to go, a study, which is called the needle study, where we will compare in uh, uh, cadavers uh, uh, bone biopsy done with both the Bordier and uh, the drill system. Maria, please go ahead.
Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Jordi, for your uh, kind uh, uh, presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Maurizio, excellent presentation. I'd like to make a few remarks about the project we are involved in the NIDO study. First of all, I wanted to point out the lack of pain with a drill assist bone biopsy in the patients to whom we have applied it. No one has had it because we performed both sedation by administration of propofol or midazolam and the local anesthesia at the site of execution in the iliac spine. Second point, with our technique, you have the opportunity to make, to take more samples compensating for the smaller diameters than the traditional technique with Bordier Meniere needle of 7.5 millimeters in diameter. For the point, as you have seen from Maurizio's slides, with our technique is neither bleeding nor a need for stitches. And it's a very remarkable point because, you know, in uh, one complication of bone biop uh, biopsy can be the infection. Therefore, if the needle study confirms the validity of our, our technique based on the consideration I have just uh, described, it will be possible to monitor the patient by performing it at the end of, example, a treatment to assess the efficacy and also for interventional study where it's always a problematic, complicated that the patient repeats the bone biopsy at the end of the study. Last but not least, the reimbursement related to bone biopsy. Please keep in your mind, without adequate bone biopsy reimbursement, each country cannot find dissemination in common clinical practice. For this region, each country should have it. Uh, Maurizio, do you want uh, to add? Uh... Uh, yes, uh, uh, regarding the, the problem of pain, uh, I think that if, if you do a good uh, sedation, even with a Bordier uh, needle, uh, you have good uh, control of pain. But probably after the procedure, when the sedation goes uh, away, uh, having a smaller and, and less invasive uh, uh, approach uh, can make a big difference because uh, of course, uh, uh, there is uh, there is less damage, and uh, uh, considering the possibility of doing more than one uh, um, uh, sample, uh, I confirm what what you said, and, and in this regard, it's very important to consider that the time needed for the biopsy is much much more shorter with the drill because it takes only. Uh, I would say five seconds to do the um, collection. Uh, the most of, most of the time is needed to prepare the patient by the procedure itself is very, very fast and non-invasive compared to, to the Bordier needle. If anybody is willing to start using this uh, uh, system, please feel free to reach to us because there are a few uh, technical issues that uh, um, are different from the way the uh, drill is used in hematology, uh, and especially the fact that we absolutely need the cortical bone, while the hematologists uh, don't care much about cortical bone. They want to go inside the bone marrow to get the cells. So they go through the cortical bone and then do the biopsy, while we need to put the needle on top of the periosteum and then get the cortical bone. So that is very different. We realized that after a few procedures. Perfect. Jordi, you are muted. Uh, it, it was great that uh, you, Mauricio, offered to, uh, to, um, to, to be in touch uh, to people who are interested in these new techniques. 
to offer your help. And, and we've heard a lot about uh, how to perform with the more friendly uh, devices or needles, uh, the, the bone biopsies. But something that uh, we've been uh, told in, in the questions and answers is that uh, there is another problem, which is the reading. And um, uh, we, we've been, for instance, uh, asked by Professor uh, Abdelbani in Egypt that if there is the possibility to send the specimens from one place to another to be, to be read. So many may have the possibility of getting the bone biopsies, but they need to send the specimens somewhere else uh, to, to be read. Is that possible? Is it possible to create a network to help those with uh, the capability of doing the bone biopsies, but not reading them? I would leave the answer to Maria, but I, I would just first remember that uh, shipping is very easy because you don't need uh, uh, cold. You just need uh, ethanol and uh, it can stay in ethanol for a few days, something like uh, three to four days. Okay. So it can be done with a, a DHL or, or a express uh, shipping system without the need uh, for, uh, for dry ice. While the uh, centers, uh, I, I would leave to Maria to comment. No, no, you are a perfect uh, comment, uh, Maurizio. And uh, I ask uh, to Peter comment this uh, slide because it's very important. Uh, in uh, Eurodas uh, website, um, improve. Uh, uh, for the contact, but in this slide, there is uh, um, each center um, can reading uh, bomb biopsy. Peter? Yeah, I, I can just add that, of course. Yeah. So I I need to, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. So, so one of the missions of UDOT, of course, is, is to disseminate uh, knowledge and expertise in bone histomorphometry. And, and we see just the opposite going on in UDOT, that's a vanishing expertise. So it's one of the major goals is to get this again uh, being, being, being available to, to every nephrologist feeling the need to have a bone biopsy. But of course, um, there is on this, you can see on this slide, all the centers in Europe, it's not all, but at least uh, uh, the majority, uh, to the best of our knowledge, of uh, centers that are uh, able or capable of reading bone biopsies. So uh, what we nowadays are building is, is some kind of a hub where we can provide the service of this uh, bone histomorphometry to external partners. Of course, we still need to discuss the financial issues. I explained to you this is a, a time-consuming procedure. So, and of course, it's also costly. So this kind of issues needs to be solved. But in a way, we feel like the need for having this kind of hubs, which could be part of this so-called multidisciplinary teams in a way. Uh, and at the end, this should become available to, to, to everyone. Besides the asset uh, of, of that, the fact that the bone biopsy can be sent because it can be stored in ethanol, so it doesn't need uh, the, the dry ice, like uh, Maurizio was, uh, was explaining. Uh, another uh, potential evolution is that, that in the future we will take pictures, so high-resolution pictures of the images uh, that can be sent to, to, to laboratories to assess the bone biopsy based on the picture, so we, we don't even need any more the tissue for the analysis. So at least things are moving. It's taking some time. But I hope that we will be able in the near future to at least providing a service to all uh, people that that feel the the need for for having access uh, access to uh, bone uh, histomorphometry. So it's work in progress. Exactly. I think it's important for our colleagues. Uh, the first step can be uh, connected with uh, Euro the website, and uh, after uh, we can send how conserve uh, the sample, uh, and uh, we we try to improve uh, um, this uh, issue for us. Well, thank you very much uh, to all of you. I, I, I'm afraid that we have consumed all the time. 
And I want to thank uh, Peter and Han because uh, they, they taught us that uh, we should definitely increase the, the role of bone biopsy. It has been neglected by nephrologists, and at least we should try to use it in complex cases and maybe the indication so will increase in the future. If we get the capabilities to do so, thanks to all the uh, advices given by uh, Professor Galliani and Maria with these new techniques, easier techniques than the old uh, uh, trepines that we were many times afraid to, to, to use. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Thank you very much, Han. Thank you very much, Mauricio and Maria. And obviously, to all, to all the viewers who have attended, uh, attended this meeting. Thank you, Jordi, and thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Good evening. Bye-bye.